right. Hello. Oh, let me get these subtitles off. Great. Hello. Welcome to AP Biology. My name is Miss LaGraves, and we're going to be hanging out all year. You're going to like it. I'm going to try. So these are lecture videos. This is going to be most of your homework. I'm going to try to keep it fun. I'm going to try to let you know what pages we're on, what you need to take notes on, and what you can skip. So um, these are, as you're seeing it right now, up on my YouTube page, uh, and we'll have one of these for almost every topic. Fantastic. So here we go. AP Biology. So we are on page four, unit one, page four. Um, so a little bit about the class throughout this course, we're going to study some core scientific principles, some theories and processes that govern living organisms and biological systems. So that's a big way of saying uh, we're going to study living things. It's broken down into science practices and content. Pause here to take notes. Here's a list of uh, science practices. So science practices are skills that you are expected to develop and apply throughout the course. So here's a list, content ex or concept explanation. So explain a concept to me, explain mitosis, explain meiosis. Analyze visual representation. So take a look at this, um, at this model, right? This picture of a cell membrane and analyze it. Tell me what's going on in it, right? Determine scientific questions and methods. So that's things like forming a hypothesis, uh, putting together an experiment, executing that experiment, creating data, all of that. Pro uh, represent and describe data. So that's the math portion, right? So looking at a data chart or a graph, learning how to describe it, and performing statistical test data analysis on that said data. Finally, to develop and justify scientific arguments using evidence. So we'll do something, uh, claim evidence reasoning. I know that that's something you ha may have done uh, in other classes. Uh, we're just going to flex those skills a little bit more here. Great, pause here to take notes. <clears throat> so now we're on page six. So AP Biology covers four big ideas. They're broken down into these four big ideas. Big idea one is evolution. It's the process of evolution drives the diversity and unity of life. So we all come from the same stuff. We all evolved into these diverse species. Uh, humans are one species. There is no subspecies of human. Um, so we're going to talk about that. It's kind of hippy dippy how we're all connected. Big idea two is energetics, right? So this is uh, biological systems use energy in building blocks to grow, reproduce, and maintain dynamic homeostasis. Dynamic homeostasis is the ability to maintain internal environments with an external changing environment. So things like it gets cold outside and I shiver and my body produces heat. So energetics, how we use energy. Big idea three is information storage and transmission. So how we store, ret uh, retrieve, transmit, respond to information. Um, things like cell-to-cell uh, -cell interactions, hormones, I mean everything. DNA to mRNA to protein, all that. And finally, systems interactions. So how do biological systems interact with each other and uh, exhibit complex properties? Fantastic. So those are the four big ideas. Pause here to take notes. So big ideas serve as a foundation of the course and are broken down into enduring understanding. So that's long-term takeaways of a concept. I like to call those EKs, essential knowledge. Learning objectives is what a student needs to be able to do with the content after, uh, in order to progress towards the enduring understanding. So that's like you have to know what an electron is in order to have a discussion about the number of electrons needed to perform the electron transport chain. You know what I mean? So it's like we're defining what you need to know in order to get to the next step. And EK is essential knowledge. So describe the knowledge required to perform the learning objectives. So um, EK is an enduring understanding. So pretty much the same. 
Um, this is all a whole bunch of nonsense. I'm just letting you know what the class is about. So we have eight units. Doot, 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 doot. Uh, unit one, chemistry. Unit two, cell structure and function. Unit three, cellular energetics, cell communication, cell cycle, heredity, gene expression and regulation, natural selection, and ecology. Now, this may look like a lot. This is going to go by very fast. The big ideas in each unit overlap and build on each other, right? So you have big ideas two to four, one, two, and four. And then you can see at the end, all four of the big ideas are discussed in our ecology unit. So you can learn each, uh, like what you learn in each unit is going to build on each other. Very similar to other biology and science classes. Great. Pause here if you want to take some notes. We are turning to page six in your note packets. <clears throat> so here we go. Here's a quick review. These are things that uh, you went over in ninth grade biology or things that you um, have sort of encountered in other science classes. So at the heart of science is inquiry. Inquiry is just being curious, asking questions. It's the search for information and an explanation. There are two steps to inquiry. The first is making observations, saying like, huh, that's weird. That looks strange. I wonder what's going on. Two is forming a hypothesis. So that is, if I do this, then this will happen because um, science, whatever scientific uh, explanation you have, right? So if I change the temperature, then the proteins will denature because the uh, peptide bonds that hold them together break under heat. That's a hypothesis. That's something we can test. So let's talk about making observations. Um, it's a way to describe these natural structures through observation analysis of data. So data we, um, we define as recorded observations. So I'm seeing something and I'm recording it down. There's two types, there's qualitative, that's observations made with the senses. More, less, bigger, smaller, faster, slower. And then there's quantitative. So that's measuring using instruments. Things like temperature, length, width, height. And we use this to flex inductive reasoning skills. So it is deriving generalizations based on a large number of specific observations. Every single day, I notice the sun rises in the sky. So I can tell you that every day the sun rises in the sky because I have observed it every day. That's inductive reasoning. Pause here to take notes. All right, forming hypotheses. This is a big one. This is something we're going to use in every unit, everything from here on out. It's a prediction that could be tested by recording more observations or experiments, right? What's up? Roll of towels? Like paper towels? Uh, I have uh, individual paper towels over there that I stole from the fourth floor. Yeah, this is my first lecture video of the year. I'm excited. They get to ask for... Miss Marchbank is, is asking for paper towels right now. She is... Very pregnant. You'll meet her in January. Going up on my YouTube page. All right, I'll see you soon. Great. Hypotheses have to be testable. All right, you can't just say, I think this one's bigger. No, you, they have to be testable. If, then, because. This is the format that we are going to use. Sometimes it's not in that format. If, then, because is the frame that we're going to use. If I increase the temperature, then the protein will denature because the peptide bonds holding them together break apart with higher temperatures. If is the manipulated variable, we call that the um, independent variable. Then is the responding variable, we call that the dependent variable. And because is the explanation. It says optional here. We are not optional with that. You must provide a scientific explanation for your hypothesis. Results can either support or refute the hypothesis. There is no right and wrong. Okay, we either accept the hypothesis or we refute the hypothesis. It's not your hypothesis is wrong. It's we're refuting your hypothesis. 
right? <clears throat> doesn't mean that your data is wrong or your experiment is wrong. Never say the hypothesis is correct because it's not correct. It's either supported by the evidence or refuted by the evidence. So deductive reasoning is specific results design, derived from general premises. And this is sort of like what the whole idea of uh, creating a hypothesis comes from, right? Is specific results uh, derived from general premises. So we have a general premise of um, proteins denature when they're heated beyond a certain temperature. Great. So we can deduce that if we were to put this protein into this solution and heat it up, then they will denature. Does that make sense? Don't worry too, too much about it. They're not going to ask you this on the exam. Fantastic. All right. So that's at the bottom of page six. I want you to skip page seven and page eight. So now we are on page nine of your notes. Forget about the concept check. We'll do that together in class. Okay, so also skip the practice. Oh, check this out. Okay, so it's this is halfway through page seven. Null and alternate hypotheses. So number one, you always want to start with a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a hypothesis which researchers try to disprove, reject, or nullify. An example, there is no difference. If I look at you and I say there's no difference, then we're talking about a null hypothesis. There is no difference between the proteins that I put into the water at room temperature and the proteins that I put into the water at a higher temperature. There's no difference. Okay. This tells you <clears throat> that your experimental observations are due to chance. So anything that you observe in your experiment is just random. It's due to chance. It's not because of anything you did. An example, there will be no difference in the headache relief between individuals who take Tylenol and those who do not. There's no difference. I forgot we used the headache and Tylenol example in the intro to bio. Great. Or Tylenol will have no effect on the headache. That is also a null hypothesis. There is no effect. There's no difference. Two, after you get your null hypothesis, list an alternate hypothesis. Start with the first one and list as many as necessary. An example of a null hypothesis is Tylenol will allow for relief when consumed by patients with headaches. It's literally just another explanation. So if your hypothesis is the Tylenol is going to relieve headache pain faster than the drug that we are trying to uh, develop, then Tylenol will allow for relief when consumed by patients with headaches would be an alternate. Tylenol will worsen symptoms when consumed by patients with headaches. It's literally just another hypothesis. All right, skip the concept check at the bottom of page seven. Skip the practice on page eight. We are now on page nine. All right, scientific method. It's a lot of fun. So the scientific, uh, most scientific inquiries do not follow a perfectly structured form. You can be working with the wrong hypothesis, have to redirect your research. I have plenty of stories about my time working at Mass General in the lab and having to um, redirect my research uh, because my hypothesis didn't work out. Um, take one more step back here. This kid knows it right down here. You know this kid. This kid knows it is that sometimes in science, you're wrong, and that's okay. We're all gonna be wrong this year. And he's like, oh man, I'm wrong about something. That's fine, we are wrong about things constantly in science. That's what makes science so cool. All right, so a hypothesis, an explanation to a question. Tested by experiment or continued by observation. So. Um, it's an educated guess to try to explain something. Hypothesis can be disproven, but can't be proven true. They can only be supported. Okay. So a hypothesis can only be supported. It cannot be proven true. Because truth in science is a little wonky anyway. 
we'll get into it. A theory summarizes a group of hypotheses. This is why theory of evolution is still a thing, is because we are still studying it as a group of hypotheses that we are able to test and looks like the evidence does support our hypothesis, but this is why uh, evolution has not made it from a theory to a law yet. It's broader in scope. New hypotheses can be generated from it. So we can provide evidence to support one hypothesis, and then we can develop another one and find evidence to support that one as well. That's where a theory comes in. Uh, supported by a massive body of evidence, right? It's a theory is not just like, oh, we're trying to figure it out. A theory is a very specific thing that um, can be tackled using a number of different hypotheses and um, a number of different data sets. It never becomes a lot. It just doesn't. It can still be. It's, it's the hippy dippy stuff, right? It's the ever changing things. Laws, on the other hand, are a statement of fact usually a mathematical formula. If it has a mathematical formula, it's most likely a law. Uh, gravity, right? Gravity. I can't make any other predictions about gravity, right? Like if I drop something, it's going to fall at a constant rate to the ground of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And there's nothing I can do about that. It doesn't matter if I'm dropping, uh, you know, a, a piece of paper, a feather, a brick, it all falls at the same rate. Um, it describes an observation. It doesn't describe how or why. It identifies something. And generally accepted to be true and universal. Doesn't matter if I'm here or in uh, Iceland. Uh, gravity is the same. It's the basis for the scientific method. So we have to establish these scientific laws because there has to be some assumption of um, continuality, right? There has to be some agreed upon truths. Uh, in order to um, perform the scientific method. Fantastic. All right. Question at the bottom of page nine, skip it. How does each picture represent corresponding item? I think we know what a light bulb is. Great. On page 10, at the top, experiments. So experiments, you start with an observation and a hypothesis. You use control groups, positive or negative, and experimental groups. Okay, control groups are something that has an already expected outcome. It either has something to do with what we already know or removing something that we know is going to be, um, is going to cause an effect. We'll get into it. A well-designed experiment should include your independent variable, your dependent variable, control group, positive and or negative. You can have more than one control group if you so choose and constants, as well as the number of trials. So in science, we do three is the number of accepted trials. If you are doing an experiment and you do the experiment twice and not three times, your paper will get rejected from peer review. You will bang your head against the wall. You will have to go back and do the experiment all over again, rewrite the peer review, submit it for approval. And then by that time, you've lost the will to continue. So please, three trials. Pause here to take notes. Lovely. All right. Variables versus constants. We are uh, about a third of the way down page 10. A variable is something that's changed. A constant does not change. That's it. Variable, constant. Boom. Done. Easy. Peasy. Lemon. Squeezy. Pause here to take notes. All right, an independent variable, the one factor that's changed by the person doing the experiment. I like to think of this as you are an independent scientist. There's no one telling you what to do. So you are the independent variable. You're the thing that's going to be changed, right? So um, different doses of things, different concentrations of things. These are all your independent variables. You always wanna change one factor. This is why I hate Mythbusters. Well, I love Mythbusters, the show, but this is why Mythbusters is unscientific, is they change multiple independent variables at the same time, and um, that's not scientific. Um, it represents a quantity that's being manipulated in an experiment. So everything else is the same, and then this is the one thing you're changing. The dependent variable is the thing that's being measured, okay? So it, it's called the dependent variable, did they say this? Yeah, it depends on the independent variable. So um, 
if I put twice as much baking soda into my baking soda vinegar um, volcano, then um, it's going to go twice as fast, right? So the independent variable would be the amount of baking soda and the dependent variable would be the time the reaction takes. That's it. It depends on the independent variable. Pause here to take notes. We're gonna be doing a lot of this independent dependent variables. It's good now to learn the difference between these two so you're not struggling later, but independent variables, you change dependent variables uh, is what we measure. Constants, they stay the same all the time. Uh, examples, uh, they vary wildly. Um, temperature, sometimes. Uh, location, almost always. We're not going to be doing this on Mars, unfortunately. We're not going to be doing this, you know, at the top of Mount Everest. We're going to be doing this at NHCS Science Lab. Um, height, you know, is another good one. Weight. Um, light, right? The amount of light. Uh, all that. Right? All that is really uh, great examples of constants. Time. So why is it important to only change the independent variable? Go ahead and think about that for a moment. It's because um, if you measure a change in the dependent variable, you won't know whether it's based on the independent variable that's causing the change. Again, this is the Mythbusters effect. They change multiple independent variables at the same time and then get a dependent variable and claim that it was due to whatever they changed. But in reality, it could have been anything. Mythbusters effect. Great. You're going to skip concept check. You're going to skip practice. Okay, so you're skipping pages 11. Just 11. Great. Moving on, we are now on page 12. Let's talk about experimental controls. So your control group is there only to compare to the experimental group. I like to use the example. Uh, I'm going to make a claim I'm the tallest person in the world. Right? That is a true statement if there's no one else to compare me to. The second someone comes and stands next to me who's taller, all of a sudden my claim doesn't hold much weight anymore. So you always need a control group to compare things to. Sorry, go ahead, stop here to take notes. Think, pair, share. So what is bias? Think about it. Turn to your pet or your wall or your sibling or your parents and tell them what you think bias is. Do you think bias can affect an experiment? Think about it, turn to your stuffed animal and uh, tell them about it. Cool. All right, control groups. There's two types of control groups. They're essential for elements of an experiment. You have to. I'm the tallest person in the world is a perfectly fine statement if it's just me and you have nothing to compare it to. But that's incorrect, that's an incorrect statement. So they help eliminate experimental errors and biases in the researchers, right? In science, a lot of our biases are, I'm expecting this result, right? Like I know that when I put water on a hot plate and turn the hot plate on, eventually it's gonna boil. But what if, you know what I mean? So like a lot of your biases here <clears throat> for researchers are just putting aside our already preconceived notions about the natural world. Um, results of the control experiments validate the statistical analysis of the experiment. So that means that like my claim, I'm the tallest person in the world is not a valid claim until you, you know, compare me to someone else. And statistical analysis is necessary to determine whether or not the data is significant. We're going to discuss this later. This comes up in chi-square analysis. Do not worry about this statement right now. Uh, when you have control groups, reliability of the experiment increases because you are, um, you are positive that the results that you're seeing is based on your independent variable and not some random chance. Controls are not constants. Controls will never be constants. You do put controls under experimental uh, pressures. Um, constants, you don't. Not to mention constants are like one factor. So like light, 
as opposed to like a group that's not going to get the treatment, right? Like it's, it's not constants. So types of control groups, there's two of them. There's two types, positive and negative. We're gonna go over each one individually. We are on page 12 still. All right, group not exposed to experimental treatment or the dependent variable is a positive control. Um, or I'm sorry, is a negative control, but it's exposed to a treatment that's known to produce the expected effect. Okay, so uh, ensures they're gonna be effect, great. So for example, let's go back to Tylenol and headaches. So I'm a scientist. I am going to develop a new drug to get rid of headaches. And I'm going to say my drug is better than Tylenol at getting rid of headaches. Okay. So uh, we get a group of people together and my experimental group is going to be taking the new drug that I have developed when they get a headache and a positive control would be patients taking Tylenol. I know Tylenol will produce the expected result. I know that when you have a headache and you take Tylenol, most likely that headache goes away. That would be a positive control. We are doing something to this group that is not the experimental treatment or independent variable. If the positive control does not produce the expected result, there might be something wrong with the experimental procedure. So if I have uh, a group of patients and I'm trying to develop a new drug for headaches, and my positive control is given Tylenol to take, and not a single one of them said Tylenol is, uh, is working, um, Tylenol doesn't get rid of my headaches, then there's something wrong with my experimental design or procedure. There's something wrong with what I'm doing. It ensures that there is an effect when there should be an effect. Great. Negative controls are the opposite. They are not exposed to any treatment. Not one that's known, not one that's not known, or they're exposed to treatments that have no known effect, right? This would be like, um, I have my patients, I'm trying to, to develop a new drug to get rid of headaches. I give uh, one group uh, the, the experimental drug that I'm working on, and I give the other group a sugar pill, right? They are exposed to some treatment, but that treatment has no effect, all right? This is to ensure that there's no effect where there should be no effect. If those patients come back and tell me, the patients who were taking the sugar pills come back and tell me, oh, these pills were great. They got rid of my headache immediately. There is something wrong with my procedure. This is groups where nothing is expected to happen. A lot of experiments do not need to contain both a positive and a negative control, but wherever possible, you should have both. Great. All right. Using positive controls. So we are on page 13 right now, 13. So scientists use positive controls when they're trying to induce a positive result. Here's our example again. If there's a new drug to treat headaches, Tylenol can be used as a positive control to show that headaches can be relieved and the patient's tested. This is a positive control. So uh, you know what, let's do this practice together. So a researcher wants to test the effect of a new antibiotic on a strain of bacteria. How would the researchers know that the new bacteria is actually effective? What do you think? Write it down in your book. I can't wait to see your answers. Boom, I skipped over it so you don't get all the answers. Anyway, using negative controls. A negative control can be a way of setting a baseline. This is used to ensure that no confounding or outside variables had an effect on the results or to factor in any likely sources of bias. So if I am expecting the patient's headaches to go away, we use a negative control to kind of remind me, oh yeah, the, um, the patients that are in that negative group, their headaches did not go away. Therefore, the patients in my experimental group whose headaches did go away means that the drug is working. It's not a source of bias or anything. Uh, it's used as an example that is not expected to work. Okay, so I do not expect this to work, but we're going to do it anyway. The group's not exposed to anything. Uh, new drug to treat headaches, a placebo can be used in negative control. So that's exactly like giving sugar pills, right? Lovely. All right, pause here to take notes. 
So practice. Doot, 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 doot. Can't wait to see your answers. A researcher wants to test the effectiveness of caffeine on heart rate. Researchers will give a negative control group a treatment that is known to have no effect on heart rate. Water has no effect on heart rate. Therefore, if water affected the heart rate in the negative control group, there's another variable affecting heart rate or the water's contaminated. Right? So their controls are really good to have in order to kind of validate what you guys are doing. All right, page 14, skip the practice. Boop, 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 boop. Skip the practice. We're going to do it together in class. That's it. Yeah, you can skip the putting it all together too. We'll do that in class. And then you'll see on page uh, doot, 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 16, 17, we'll design our own experiments. That'll be fun. All right. Thanks for joining. See you in class.